All right, good morning again, and we'd like to welcome everybody visiting with us on YouTube. Welcome, and uh, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. Well, maybe 18. We'll decide when we get there. So if you turn in your Bibles there, the title of the message is Deep and Very Dark. And uh, there are issues in our life circumstances that from time to time feel deep and very dark, uh, depending on what we're thinking of and what we're focused on. Uh, but I want to bring your attention as we begin setting the stage uh, to a man whose name was Bruce Davidson. And Bruce Davidson was a guy who got, uh, he, he went down under the ocean. He went to great depths under the ocean in these bubble submarines. And I don't know if you ever saw one before, but I'd like to show you one right here. And so this is one before it goes down. And they can go to very uh, deep areas of the ocean where you normally don't go and you can't see anything. And so then if you could put the next one, we see him underwater. And you can see that the lower you go, you know, it's dark down there. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about what he did. He went 1,500 feet down into the ocean and uh, really had no idea of what he would be running into down there until he found this 120-foot long thing that was transparent, had thousands of tentacles and multiple stomachs. And if you could put it on there and give the people, there you go. Uh, now imagine, imagine that thing 120 feet long. That's longer, th that's longer than this room is that way. It's longer than the building is. And so his little bubble comes up to this. For all we know, that thing thinks it's food. And uh, we have a few more pictures that we could put up here. Uh, just different angles. And so while you're showing them this and maybe the next one, Understand that when he saw this thing, he decided to back off and come back up to shore and, and realized he was surrounded by friends. And th there was these monsters down there that were all around him checking out his little bubble machine. Is that the last one we have? Or do we? Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea. But, you know, it just doesn't look 120 feet long up there on the screen, but it is. And so when we consider the darkness that is all around us in the spirit world, understand that there are giants, there are demonic forces, and they do have friends. And so people seem to be unable to actually realize the actual angelic world, whether it's fallen angels or godly angels, but they're all around us in a dimension that is very close. You just cannot see them. And so demons understand that the best way to hurt God, who they hate, is to go after God's kids. Now, you who have had children, you understand what that means in a personal way. Something happens to one of your kids. Look out. And so think of how God feels then. You're the apple of his eye, right? And so the demons understand this is how you can really bring pain to God. We become the target for demons. And so demons not only work alone, but oftentimes they work with friends. And so friends in dark places. Many times we don't realize all the things that we're up against, and that's why you've heard a stress for prayer this morning. And so today we're going to be looking, trying to get a graphic view, more of a tangible view of what's going on around us. On Monday morning, it isn't like you just get up and that's the whole world in which you can see. You have invisible enemies that hate you and want to lure you into places that are going to be painful and hurtful for you. And they want to do damage to your relationship between you and Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see not only that, taking a look into this really real world, but we'll be taking a peek into what Jesus said. Who was he talking to in between the time of his death on the cross and his resurrection? And so before we do that, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn it over. Um, yeah, let's stand for the reading of the word and Chad's going to go ahead and lead us. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring as to God, having been put to death to the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that 
baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through a resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. At this time, if you are able, please take a knee. If not, take a seat and let's have prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you open our eyes and our ears, Lord, to your will, Lord, as we continue to dive in and take and digest what you said here, Lord. We just thank you for everything you're doing in your life, Lord. We thank you for everybody's here, but pray that you open our minds and our thoughts to what your will is today, Lord. We just thank you for what you're doing in our lives, but most importantly, we look forward to what you're going to do in the future, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chad. That's great. Great to be covered by the presence and the protection of our Lord and Savior. So the first section, if you're following along on your note sheet, is that there is a coexistence going on. There's a coexisting world that we're living in, and we coexist with these spirits, uh, often called demons or angels. In verse 18, the Bible did end with, but made alive in the spirit. So we're talking about a spiritual area, a spiritual dimension, and we want to go behind the veil to see what's going on in this very really real world because it's not all tangible. It's more than what you can see that is going on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, we see here, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's the aspect of the, uh, the dimension that we want to look at this morning. There are multitudes of spirits called angels. And uh, you see here in Matthew 26, uh, 53, that Jesus was saying, did you not know that I could call down legions of angels? And one legion according to the Roman military, was 6,000 soldiers. So could you imagine Jesus saying that I could call down 12 legions of angels would mean that there would be 72,000 angels at his disposal. And so they would come there to protect him, assist him, and, and whatever. Not that he needed protection, but he had the ability. They were at his fingertips. Revelation 5, 11 describes 100 million angels worshiping. So if you had a great time worshiping this morning, imagine what's going to be like in heaven when you have so many, not only humans, uh, but you also have these angelic beings worshiping. There were a multitude of angels that were seen in the sky praising God in the shepherd's fields of Bethlehem when Jesus was born on that night. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible tells us that you have probably entertained or hosted an angel without knowing it because these things can take on the appearance of a human being. And you may not have ever known that you were dealing with an angel. And uh, perhaps if we had dialogue, we would find out stories where you wondered, if, was somebody actually an angel working in your life? In Ephesians chapter 6, we see that there is a demonic hierarchy, that demons have rank and uh, there are positions that they hold um, as they work in the world. It's a very organized network also. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, I need to read that one, where the Bible says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. When I look at that verse, sometimes I wonder about churches in regard to heavenly places. Because Satan wants to do a lot of damage in the body of Christ. And as we saw yesterday, which was highly emphasized, so many churches are going woke. And they're falling into this whole erroneous political scene, which is absolutely ridiculous. And who would trade? You would think, who would trade the Bible for political correctness? But that's what's happening in our country today. It's all part of satanic activity to tear our country and the church down. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we see that we're called to an offensive fight against these spirits, powers, principalities, and all that there are coming against us. 
it isn't that we're supposed to wait till something negative happens to us and then all of a sudden we want to pray. That's usually what happens and it's okay to do that. But why not be a church that goes on the offensive against demonic forces before the what not ever happens? And that's the way God would like us to be. I believe that we're to take territory as far as souls, communities. We're not supposed to be containers just meeting together and looking at the Bible and us four no more, but we're supposed to be channels. And that takes an offensive attack against our enemy to take them out, breaking down strongholds. And uh, all that being said, just to throw it in there, you probably do have a guardian angel because there's lots of them that God created. And two thirds of them are holy angels as opposed to the one third that have fallen. That we have been called to a battle and we can tear down these enemy strongholds and our greatest weapon is prayer. And so the flesh is very real, but I want every one of you to realize that the spiritual world is very real, just as real as that which you can see, feel, and touch. You don't see that spiritual world. And so sometimes it just is a natural tendency to think that it doesn't exist, that there are no enemy forces against me. But that's not true. I wanted to bring to your attention that on January 8th in the year 2014, a meteor passed through the Earth's atmosphere. And it wasn't that far from us. Um, at about 2 o'clock Phoenix time on that date, this thing caught the Earth's atmosphere and landed in the Pacific Ocean. Now, nobody said anything about it. There were no astronomers that were giving you the warning. And you didn't know it was there. Why? Well, you didn't see it. It just came into our atmosphere very close to our planet. And can you imagine if you consider sunset crater over there in northern Arizona and the damage that could be done? What if that thing landed in Los Angeles or San Francisco or one of these cities? But it did land in the Pacific Ocean. Well, just to note, it was close. It was very dangerous. Scientists said it could have been very catastrophic. Well, you didn't see it, so you didn't care. You didn't worry about it. You weren't stressed out about it because you didn't see it. But it was there. And so are these fallen angels called demons that would love to ruin your life. You didn't see that meteor, but it was going on all around you. And the same is true about the spiritual world that we are living in. It's here, whether we like to acknowledge it or not. So there is a coexisting world that I initially want to bring to your attention. And then as we move through this text, we come to this cosmic conflict that is going on. And in verse 19, the word of God said, in which also he, Jesus, went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, not in the water. It's important. To know that when you get to the next verse. They were brought through the water, not in the water, not under the water. They passed through. They were above the water. Uh, no one never went under water. That's important when you begin to read. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. See, it's not water baptism that's being talked about where you go under the water as though it were a watery grave and then risen to walk in the newness of life. That's not the picture that Peter is painting here. Um, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's a picture of Jesus, really, as though the ark were Jesus. We're in the ark and, and we're saved. And so, point being, in context of this Bible study, the cosmic conflict that is happening in this very really real world. Lucifer has always wanted throughout the ages to kill the offspring right, of Messiah. Ever since the very beginning in the garden, the issue, the goal, has always been to stop the birth of to pollute the, the birth of Messiah and destroy that lineage by polluting it. And so he's, he's really the guy that has invented the counter move, 
There's an attack and a counter move, an attack and a counter move. And this goes on throughout all of eternity. So when you're reading your Bible and, and you read all this stuff in the Old Testament, it's more than a historical book. There's all of this information given to us to show us, partly, that there is this attack, counterattack going on as Lucifer is trying to destroy Israel. Why? Because the Messiah is coming through Israel. And he wants to pollute that line of the Messiah. Now we just take a look at Genesis 3.15 here, and you can see where the stage is really set for all of this. And the Lord God, after the temptation and the fall with Adam and Eve, he addresses Lucifer and he says, I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The first indication of a virgin birth because the man has the seed, the woman has the egg. See that? First indication right there. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him. That would be Jesus Christ on the heel as Jesus steps on the serpent's head a, there again, another picturesque way of saying that there is going to be the conflict. Jesus is going to suffer minor injuries compared. You think, wow, crucifixion is pretty bad. He's going to suffer minor injuries compared to what's going to happen to Lucifer for all eternity. Now, when you follow world history and people on the planet, you'll see in Genesis chapter 4 that Satan inspired Cain to kill his brother. So you've got to stop the lineage that's going to lead to the giving birth of Messiah into this world. So you follow then the next son that Adam and Eve produce, and you have Seth. And so the new line toward the Messiah goes through Seth. But then the world got polluted with sin again as Lucifer now counterattacks. And the Bible tells us that the population of the whole world was so wicked that it became unredeemable. And there, Satan inspired such wickedness that God would then flood the entire world except for these eight people with Noah. But that's all the work of Lucifer. And it gets even deeper than that, as we'll see. In Genesis 27, Satan inspired Esau to kill his brother. So, well, you know, I'll just kill him because he stole my blessing and birthright. And that was the initial feeling, the mentality of Esau uh, before Jacob hoofed it up north. And so the seed leading to Messiah is in Jacob. Exodus 1.22, Pharaoh wants to throw all the male children into the Nile River. Remember that? And so that was the counsel of Pharaoh. Just kill them all. Pharaoh had no idea what was really going on because Lucifer was working in him. Get rid of the, the, the line of the Messiah. And so King Saul tried multiple times to kill another person that was in the lineage of Jesus. King David multiple times tried to kill him. Second Kings chapter 11, this is a classic. You have Ahaziah, who's the king of Judah, and he gets killed with Ahab. Jehu takes them out. And so then Athaliah, his mother, usurps the throne in Judah. And to make sure that she can continues to keep the power in the throne in Judah. She has all her grandchildren and all her children killed. Except there was, I believe it was Athaliah's, no, it was Ahaz's sister, and she hid Joash, a one-year-old boy, maybe not even one years old. And so Athaliah never got to her grandson Joash to kill him. And then six years later, he's seven years old, and you'd read the story and see that she loses her life. Um, they kill her in the Valley of ben Hinnom, And Joash continues. You think of that through, though. There's one person left. Here's this guy, Joash. And he's just a little boy, but he, God has him protected. And the lineage continues to be clean all the way through. Haman ordered all the Jews to be killed during the times of Esther. Herod wanted all the baby boys below the age of two to be slaughtered in Bethlehem. Uh, Hitler killed six million Jews. And Satan has enticed Jesus, even once he was a grown man in a human body, took him to the temple and said, just jump. Go ahead, jump. Because the Bible says, you know, the angels will come and protect you and they'll take care of you. They'll lower you down gently. You won't die. And so Satan encouraging the death of Jesus Christ before the cross. And so 
Even in Nazareth, they take Jesus off to the cliff and they wanted to throw him over the edge of this cliff. Uh, but Jesus walked through the people and got away because it wasn't his time. All those instances throughout the human race, just to show you the, the attack, the counterattack of Lucifer against Jesus Christ. You can say, well, that was all history and that was mostly Old Testament. It's going on right now. It's happening right now. Satan doesn't want Christian parents raising their children to know about Jesus. So I, I could go on with example of example of how culture has deteriorated. I mean, I, I got to get everything in this Bible study because it just it speaks so loudly to all of us of our need for prayer and to understand that it isn't just the population. You know, these people in, in politics and who are really ruling the world talk about all this uh, information Bill Gates likes to tell us that the world cannot sustain 9 billion people. So basically, what's the plan? Kill people off. This is why you got to have Planned Parenthood. I'm rabbit trailing, but it's all true. And so, but all these things, and you know, beyond that, there's all kinds of ways that they're keeping the population or trying to keep the population down. In Daniel, speaking of the cosmic conflict, it took 21 days for Daniel to get an answer from God. And so after praying and waiting and waiting for God to respond you know, with an answer in direction, the Bible tells us here that in Daniel 10, 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is Iraq, to, no, Iran, Iran, was withstanding me for 21 days. So there was a demonic battle against holy angels going on for 21 days. And then behold, Michael, there's your Michael the archangel, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left there with the kings, plural, of Persia. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get kings of Persia in human form. But in demonic form, you get plural. So there are angelic beings of rank, notoriety, and hierarchy that are placed over given areas all over the world. You know what? God brought me here. This was not on my radar, and I don't know that it was on anybody's radar 29 years ago. But this is the place God sent me to. And I often wonder, who's in charge of this place demonically? Who is that demon? And will the Christians attack this thing in prayer? Because I'm sure there are many friends. Remember the monster down deep, 1,500 feet below? And it had friends. And they were big, 120 feet, big to a human being, right? So you have an enemy that's an expert in guerrilla warfare that you can't even see. We call them demons. I'll tell you what. I've, I've seen so many games and so many tricks. We get all these things that come in the mail. Here's how you can grow your church. Even though the Bible said, Jesus quoted, I will build my church. That's what he said. So, I mean, I can't make one person come through these doors. There's no way I can do that. It's all in God's... You know why you're sitting here? God brought you here. Amen. He brought you in here. He put it in you to come here. I, I had nothing to do with it. I just do my ministry according to the best of my ability that is given by God. But I wonder about the demonic presence here, and the stronghold in this community. In order to, we are walking around here praying 7.30 in the morning, and you know there's a guy at the house over there pounding away. They've got to build a deck, and they've got to build this thing in their house. And God knows you've got to work on your truck, and your blah, blah. You've got to clean your shotgun. And all that, you know, a great time to do that is Sunday morning. That's all demonic. That's, that's of that unseen world. You have an enemy, they have friends. Without Jesus Christ, none of you are a match for what's going on. It's so important to make Christ truly, not just say, well, Jesus is my priority in my life. I hope he is. He needs to be. Demons are assigned these geographical areas, and you can bet your life. L.A., San Francisco, Hollywood. My goodness, what kind of creepy creatures, what monsters are working in Hollywood? God. I mean, 
If you read the book of Revelation, you will see in chapter 2, verse 13, that uh, the Lord says that Pergamum is where Satan's throne is. I, I wonder if he moved to Hollywood. So from there, you can export filth all over the world. Chicago. You think all this... Come on, you don't, you don't believe that money can fix Chicago, do you? You really don't think that programs can fix Chicago, do you? You don't really think politicians can fix Chicago, do you? That's, 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 it's beyond human fixing. Only Jesus Christ can fix Chicago. What kind of demon is over Chicago? How many are working with him? And God knows the invisible creature is running the United States of America right now. Those people came a hair's breadth away from telling you who's running this country and which president is doing it. It does not take a rocket scientist. If you wanted to tear down America, somebody with an Islamic connection would be perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. <laughs> Boy, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Let's go ahead and read it all together, all right? So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So God doesn't want us to be ignorant of these things. We're not to go run around like an ostrich somewhere and stick our head in the sand and ignore demonic warfare or not participate in it. You know, I know what, I'm just I'm not into that. Well, you don't have to be into fighting off demons, but they're into tearing up your whole life, that's for sure. Know that you're in this battle. Know that you have an enemy that wants to not only ruin your life, he wants to ruin your witness. You know, it's, I don't know if I have one of these things. I think I do. You know, again, I do this a lot. But these things, your bulletin, post office, just stick it up there. Ron's Market, stick four of them up there. Somebody's going to look at that and they're going to read this thing. And it could be their difference between heaven and hell. Why not? Hand it to somebody. Hang it or hand it. That's a good one. You ought to remember that one. It's not on your note sheet, but you ought to put it in there. Hang it or hand it every week. George Patton. Everybody knows George Patton, right? Know your enemy. Don't be ignorant of his tactics. So George Patton was uh, battling uh, Erwin Rommel the desert fox in northern Africa. And they got so close to one another in the battle at one time that Patton, and you read all kinds of bold and crazy stories about this guy, stood up in his Jeep and yelled twice, I read your book! Hey, I read your book! And Patton knew the, the strategy, the worst strategies, because Rommel was dumb enough to write a book. So I don't know if his pride was so great that he just wanted to be more important than he really was, but Patton read the book. So everything Rommel was about to do, Patton was over there yelling that he read his book. And of course, Rommel was eventually defeated. And uh, it had all of the details of wartime strategies in a book called Infantry Attack by Rommel. But hey, you know what? We don't have Satan's playbook per se. We don't have a book that Satan did write, but we do have God's book, amen? You got God's book. We have a Bible. And it's good to read it and believe it. God authored this book explaining demonic activity, but he also included our victorious future. And what a perfect song to end that worship set. I'm going to see a victory. And that's what you got to remember in your life. No matter how difficult it gets, no matter what you're surprised with on any given day, just understand that greater is he that is in you than what? He that, that's right. And we've got to remember that. This place is not heaven. You know, there's that guy. What's that? It's, you know, I never want to get in trouble. It just happens to me. But you know the guy that says, this is your best life now? How can that be? You know, the guy in Texas thinks you can have your best life now on, the, on this earth. How could that possibly be when Jesus is preparing a place for me in glory? So, man, you know, you got so much to look forward to. Now, I got some verses here I wanted to show you just regarding 
uh, this book that God has given us in, in the instructions. So 2 Corinthians, we see here in chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And so we even have to destroy speculations. You get ideas of depression in your mind. You know, you've got to claim the victory and who God says you are. That's why we have those little maroon-colored books, little burgundy-colored books out in the foyer. Take that thing. Read it. Get it in you. It'll change your life to find out who you really are in Christ. And we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, taking those thoughts captive. Can we put on the next one there in Romans, I believe? 1530. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. And anyway, all the attack that was coming. Paul, as mighty as he was, right? A guy that was involved in so many miraculous things. And he's saying, pray for me, people. Will you pray for me? And here this letter goes out, and so many people did got it. You know, the request was for prayer because he knew the spiritual end of the battle was the source of the physical part of the battles. And all the people that would mouth off to him and put him down and gossip and slander about him, the source was from the invisible world. And we had one more here in Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. Why? To make known the gospel. Do you ever, you know, well, I don't have anything to pray about. Well, pray that utterance would be given to you to become bold and speak out the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in Black Cane Sea. This, if you haven't heard me say this, I'm, this is... This is my mind, this is my heart and soul. Whatever walks through these doors, whoever, to hear the gospel, to hear the message, I'm going to be faithful to everything God gave me. God made me a lettering artist. I paint those core plastic signs, I throw them all over town. They must be effective because other people want to copy them too. And so, <laughs> and so you know, they would, got to do that too. Hey, that must be what works. Look what Pastor Hawk's doing. I'll have those things out there until I can't letter anymore. And it doesn't matter what the response is. The point is, no way, no how, am I going to stand in front of my king and say I didn't use everything that God gave me to proclaim the gospel, even if it's a sign. I'm going to do everything I can. And I would hope that you would too. Hang it, hand it, speak it, but be ready and prepared. And if you don't feel like doing that, Pray for boldness to do it because God says through his word, we can pray for that boldness to be more active in the battle, not lay down and die. So all throughout history, there's an attack. There's a counterattack, attack, a counterattack. One of the big battles we're heading to is in Ezekiel 38 and 39. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you go home and read it. Ezekiel chapter 38, chapter 39. What? <laughs> We're so there. Talk about battle to kill off Israel. You know, Messiah came, paid the price on the cross. You read Romans 5.10, the Bible tells us that we are saved by his life. The cross paid the penalty. The resurrection provided life. That's the gift of God, eternal life in Jesus Christ. And you need both. But even after that, Lucifer is still at it to destroy Israel so that he could mess up the whole plan of the millennium, the rescue operation of Jesus' return to rescue Israel. It's always after the kids, because he hates God. But understand that there is so much at stake, it's more serious than most people who claim to be Christians even understand. It's a battle for souls. And right now, the stage is totally set. You have someone running our... Do you really believe that this man we call president, is running this place? He just fell asleep at a political meeting in Israel with other government dignitaries. The guy just fell asleep. At the We're just being honest. This guy, God bless him, somehow, some way, if he can save his soul. But he, he's not calling the shots. You've got to be kidding me if you think he's calling the shots. He's not. 
And so what you have is the United States of America that's been influenced. And we hand over all these weaponries, all this information um, to our Islamic enemies in Afghanistan who share them with China. And you have all these other countries that are surrounding Israel. And you know that Iran and Libya and Sudan and Russia and Turkey are all looking to come down as allies and wipe out Israel. But the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 38, 39 that God's going to destroy them right there on the Golan Heights. I hope CNN is watching. I hope Don Lemon is reporting on that. <laughs> yeah. It's always a battle of attack and counterattack, which moves us from the coexisting world that we're in to the cosmic conflict. And now we come to the convicts of the really real world. And in verse 19, we did read in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in, pre in prison. Now, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, speak of this place. It's called the Abuso. And in the Abuso are demonic creatures who have crossed the border of what they could do to tempt people, to hurt people on the earth. And they are in what is described a depthless pit. But some of your translations might call it a bottom, bottomless pit. And this is a place of demonic incarceration. And so what did they do to get there could be the question that arises. And it is a place where other demons never want to go. Even demons and a man, uh, when Jesus said, well, who are you? And they said, legion, for we are many. And remember, 6,000 are in one legion. Our name is legion because there's a lot of us in one man. And, and they, they said, you're not sending us before our time, are you? Remember that? And so they're very concerned. They do not want to go to this place, the Abuso. In Jude, we see that there is a place where these demons left. And the Bible says because they left their first estate. They, they left. They were allowed. They're allowed to go so far. But in going so far, they did something very nasty. And Peter alludes to this in 2 Peter chapter 2. God did not spare the angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah. So going back, see, preserved Noah, talking about that flood time, what about these demons at the time of Noah and what was really going on with all that? That they got thrown into what some refer to as gloomy Dungeons, referring to fallen angels who overstepped their boundaries and they did go cohabit with human beings. Turn to, in your Bibles, Genesis chapter 6. If you would turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. We'll take a look. And you will see when we get here in Genesis chapter 6. Always come gather with the church. Always bring your Bible. Genesis chapter 6. You're going to see three types of beings. You'll see the sons of God, the main Elohim, a, refer a reference to angels, and you will see the daughters of men. There's three. The sons of God looked at the daughters of men. Three. So now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, these are the Bain Elohim, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And when the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. And that would be not you're going to live 120 years it's your, the, before the flood is going to be 120 years. The building of the ark is going to occur in that time. In verse 4, the Nephilim were on the face of the earth in those days and also afterward. Note that, also afterward. Then the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. And those were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. These are giants. These are giant people. 
uh, when you when the, the area was excavated of Sihon, uh, Og, and now I'm forgetting their names. Og and Sihon. I think it was Sihon. They found an iron bed, 13 and a half feet long. Uh, they have found doorways 16 and a half feet tall. That wasn't for, you know, just the look of having a big mansion. It was for these guys that were so tall and so big. And so these creatures cohabited. How did they do something like that? Look, I don't know. I haven't seen the video and I don't want to, but I'm just telling you. There are all kinds of assumptions and there are other theories that seem to weaken. They do weaken. But when you consider the demon possession of a man, it could happen that way. And just to think, you know, it's gross sounding, but if a person died while the body is still warm and a demon inhabited that dead body and it came to life because of the devil, and then it could operate on the earth through that corpse and do what the Bible just says that they did. Now, how do I know that it could very possibly be that? When you get to Numbers chapter 33, 13, you'll discover there that the Nephilim are back on the earth after the flood. Well, how did that happen? What are they doing? Numbers 33, 13 says that they are back on the planet after the flood. Nobody that was a giant, a Nephilim, got on that boat. But these Nephilim are back. They're called the sons of Anak also. These are giant offspring and they're a generation of unredeemable human beings. They all died out at the flood, but then they showed up in Numbers chapter 13. But fear not, though. The Bible goes on to tell us that there is a conquest. There's a conquest all over all of the really real world. And back in our text in 1 Peter, we see in chapter 3, verse 22, speaking of Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. This brings us to a place that was mentioned in verse 19. Noting that throughout history, Lucifer has been in a constant, continual planning and attacking mode. And that's something we need to pay attention to because when you sleep, demons plan. You think they don't know your weaknesses? They know every weak spot in you. Everything. It could be what goes on. It could be your temperament. It could be your emotional. You know, what, what is the weakest point of your emotions? They play against all that stuff to tear you down and to keep you out of the lineup of serving God. But in the conquest over these demons, between the cross and the resurrection, Jesus Christ preached a victorious proclamation. Some of your Bibles say preached. He did not go down to Tartarus or the Abuso and preach a gospel message. This isn't going to a place where people had passed away and giving them a second chance by preaching the gospel. A better word for preaching is he proclaimed. And basically what he said was, the war is over and you lost. And he was preaching to those demons a proclamation that the victory is his. And that means the victory is ours. And the victory is yours. And no matter what demonic forces have done to you throughout your life, you are still in the victory position. You're in that victor circle in the end as you keep your focus on Jesus Christ. That's the message. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, or, uh, to that demonic warfare, therefore it says, when ascended, he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. There was an area that Luke 16 refers to as Abraham's bosom. And apparently, it's that people passed away in the Old Testament, but the blood had not been spilt from the cross yet. And this area is called Abraham's bosom. It's a comfort place. And so there's a dialogue going on between this man, and he's trying to speak with another guy named Lazarus, and Abraham's involved. You can read it in Luke 16. There's dialogue. You want to find out what hell's like? The guy tells you right there in Luke chapter 16. Very real. And so Jesus 
led those people in Abraham's bosom out of there. He led a captive host of captives, and they gave gifts to men. Although this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? It was a hole. It's under the earth. It's the abyss. It's in... It's a bottomless pit. And he who descended is himself also who, he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fulfill all things. And on that trip, the proclamation was made. The war is over. You lost. And I won. How many of you ever in school had a teacher that gave you a test and handed you the paper and then said, and I want you to do your best, but the answers are all in the back of the book. Did anybody ever have that? You did? Anybody? Raj? Yeah. I had that happen in college. <laughs> but they're all liberal, so I don't know what that was supposed to mean. They, this is the same thing that has happened for us. God gave us a book, and the answers are all in the back of the book. And the devils are going to be released. And when you continue reading through Revelation 9, after you read verse 1 and 2 about the abbess and all these demonic creatures that are in there, you see some of the horrors that are going to come upon the earth during the Great Tribulation. So you don't want to be here. You want to be there. You don't even want to look at the video of that one. But it's before the actual return of Christ, part of the Great Tribulation. But in the meantime, we're here now. And this is very important to understand as you put 1 John 4.4, 4, Come on, you know this. Greater is, right? All together. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. You have the, the power of the victor, our victorious king, inside of us. He resides by his Holy Spirit inside each and every one of us. We have got to remember that. That at the end of the day, when the battle is over and our time on this earth is done, and we go to see and meet our king and bow the knee and bend and bow before him. Because he's a king. Like, see, he's our, he's our king right now. That's why we even have worship. That's why you have people who are part of worship teams. And worship leaders, they're just drawn to that. They're anointed for that kind of an expression of praise toward God to understand that in heaven, though, you're not going to need any Kleenex, there's not going to be any pain, and you'll never tell anybody to have a good day because they're all good. There ain't no bad days. They're all going to be good. So, If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, please live like it in these last moments of the church age. A lot of times you see when you're playing around on your computer, click share, or you know, you're, you're texting. Click share. You want to share this thing? Be a born-again Christian who shares. Click share. Walk out the door of your house and click share with people. Don't let anyone in this community have any kind of an excuse that they could blame and put on you. Well, they don't have one anyway. Romans said so. They should be able to look around at what's going on, the stars, the sun, the color of the sun, the sky, the mountains, and they should be able to see with the seasons that come in one year, coming and going in you know, perfect synchronization that somebody's in control. There's a designer of the design. And so they're without excuse. But never let anybody in this town say, he or she didn't tell me. Don't do that. Don't exit this place. And let anybody ever say, oh, I knew that person. They never told me. They never welcomed me into eternal life with Jesus Christ. So understand, I cannot emphasize in closing now the need to experience a more intensified experience of waiting on God in prayer. Let's say you just didn't even know what you were going to say to God. Don't you know that if you just got down before God in a quiet area and you just said, you know, I'm going to sit here for 10 minutes, don't you know that the Holy Spirit would speak to you? Don't you know that he would impart into your head someone to pray for, a situation to take before him, a stronghold to demolish, to blow up, to terrorize? Terrorize the enemy back. And if you waited on God, don't you know that 
He would put it in you. He would direct your prayers. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to witness. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to empower you to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, the remotest parts of the world, in Black Canyon City, in Anthem, Cordes, Spring Valley, Phoenix, anywhere we can touch, anywhere we can go. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not for whatever you see on television or maybe something you saw a long time ago. It's to make you strong. It's to make you bold. So shine and proclaim. And may you be a more welcoming person, inviting people. Be a real follower. And I, I really do. My last thing I want to say today is this. I agree that the term Christian doesn't resonate with anything positive to the lost world anymore. It just doesn't. It's like go to church. Go to church doesn't resonate with anybody. It doesn't mean anything to people anymore. But when you consider Christian, now that it's looked down on, now that our government and those in power are, are belittling Christianity and Jesus Christ as much as possible, and they're elevating Islam more and more, understand that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. When you present to somebody else who may inquire with you or someone you're sharing, you click share with this person and you're in dialogue, you might think about calling yourself a follower of Christ, a follower of Jesus. Because if you say Christian, for all I know, it can invoke feelings of hatred. Oh, you Christians who don't want to kill murder babies. See, they're all twisted. They're blinded. They're in a demonic fog. You're the ones who are out of the fog. You get it. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. I want to pray real quick here. Okay, let's just... Father, in these last moments, I want to call out to you to unleash your power in such a way that every person would for 100% certainty walk out of here knowing that they were born again and that it would not be a certain question mark in their mind or in their soul. But everyone would have just a greater uh, value for you, the victor. There's victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. That no matter what the enemy does, we come out on top with Jesus. But I do want to pray that everyone will have the sureness, the assurity of salvation. And we're, we're, we're on YouTube. Have no idea. We have watchers out there. And so whether you're in the building or whether you're watching, I just want to quickly note that Real love is passing through the aisles of this church right now. It's wherever you're watching this, on your phone or your com computer. And that God wants you to know that, yeah, we're sinners. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And that we can be saved by grace through faith. Not of works. That we can give up our lives here to take up an eternal life with Jesus Christ. And if we're willing to turn away from our past, if we're willing to trade it in, if we're willing to turn away from sins and all the behaviors and thoughts that don't please you, if you're willing to turn away from that and come to Jesus, I'd love to lead you in a prayer right now to ask Christ to take over control of your life. You, know, you look at your life and you're in control of it. Have you messed it up? You don't have to stay in that condition. Jesus Christ is reaching down. We talked about a spirit world today, and he's reaching to you right now, and he says, today is the day of salvation. Today is your day, whether you planned it or not. It was on his calendar to talk to you right now. Don't pass up that opportunity. God's calling people to eternal life right now. And in a sense, to get away from that eternal life, you'd either have to walk through these doors or turn off that computer in a sense of bowling over right over Jesus Christ to knock him down, tell him to get out of your life and say, I don't want that. Or would you say, I give up, I surrender and come to Jesus. 
And instead of just ignoring him or giving him an elbow and pushing him over out of the side, that you would open your arms and say, I need you so much. And if that's you, why don't you pray right now? And I'll help you. I'll just, I'll lead you in prayer. I'm just helping you. He'll save you. I can't. But why don't you just tell him right now, even here in this building, if you've never really committed to Christ, just tell him right now. Talk to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I agree with you. I deserve hell. But I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the Lord of all. He's the only Savior. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. If you empower me right now, I'm willing to forsake sinful behavior and a sinful thought life. Wash my sins away as I put my faith in Jesus. I give you total control. Grant me the mind of Christ. Never let me go. Thank you for saving my soul. Just because I believe. Amen. Y'all can look up. I don't have any contact with people out there in YouTube land, but I do here. And so I'm going to ask you if you just hold off with the Bibles and zipping and purses or whatever you do uh, to prepare to go off. If you prayed like that, would you do something very simple but very important? The Bible says all the angels of heaven rejoice over one soul that receives Christ. But the angels are not God. They don't see through you. Eh? They don't know what's going on inside you. And so I would like to just give you the opportunity. If you prayed like that with me this morning, would you do something real simple and just lift your hand up? Did anybody in the room? God bless you. God bless you. Is there anybody else? In this? You just want to make sure. You want to be sure. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and stand. And uh, Father, I want to pray your blessings upon these people. Thank you for meeting us here this morning. Thank you for the band that graciously came here out of Phoenix. Would you please bless them for coming yes, here? Because they blessed us greatly. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells in our midst. Rise up, O oh God, your enemies be scattered. Yes, my God. And in these last moments of the church age on the earth, please rescue people. Lord, please rescue them. Uh, and if you don't have mercy on people in Black Kenya City, especially because this is our home base, as well as other communities, but especially Black Canyon, they don't stand a chance. They need your mercy. And regardless of what they've said about us, slandered, done, <laughs> steal the signs, bend the rebar. Lord, they're just, they don't know what they're doing. Yes. And, and they have forsaken you. Please have mercy to reveal yourself to them in a way that they cannot deny. Save now. Hosanna. In Jesus' mighty name. Bless the people as they go out the door, full of the Holy Spirit, yes, walking in a new and living way forsaking their old thoughts and their old behaviors. Amen. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus never fails. Well, God bless you as you go his way this day.